The other big take home message I'd like you guys to take away from our intro to ecological restoration is this notion of how restoration is done oftentimes in practice. As we mentioned, a lot of times we don't have full data. We don't have a complete knowledge of the species composition, um, et cetera. So what has, uh, what is oftentimes the, the case is this notion of what I call restoration by best guess. So you most clearly see this when you're touring, touring a site that has failed, that the restoration did not work. And so these are all quotes that I've, real quotes from anonymous people, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, but things that people told me on a tour of their restoration site. So this first one was um, uh, why this particular uh, uh, hillside area um, didn't, uh, the, the plants didn't grow and, the, and the, the organisms didn't come back. And, and this guy just kept saying, oh, no, 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 no. And I said, well, so I kept saying, but why? Well, why did that not work? Why did that not work? And he said, well, it probably had something to do with El Nino, right? Not that I was measuring rainfall here and determined that the rainfall washed the seeds away or something like that. It was, just, it was like, I don't know, probably this, right? Next was uh, a project uh, trying to restore oak woodlands. And these guys planted a bunch of uh, acorns and little seedlings. And most of those trees did not live. And so I said, wow, how, what, how come the trees didn't live? I don't know, they're all, they're all dead. And I said, why? He goes, I don't know, I, I bet you it was voles. So voles, these little, little rodent, right, that, that like to teeth. And a lot of times they'll go up and they will um, gird a tree. They're like biting like their front teeth like that. And they kind of root and they'll work their way around the tree. So essentially they cut off the circulatory system uh, for the tree. And then the tree over the course of a, you know, or seedling over the course of a couple days or whatever dies. Not that, not, hey, I actually sat out here and I watched and I saw a bunch of voles. Not that I put out a trail camera and documented these guys doing this. Not that I went and matched the dentition, the, the, the bite marks on the thing with these guys. It was like, I don't know, probably this, right? And then my favorite is this one where, you know, I asked this guy why this wetland wasn't working and he had said all these things and they just didn't make any sense. I said, really? So that doesn't really seem, all those things you said, that, I don't, that doesn't really seem to be, I, I, that, that doesn't seem to jive with what I think probably happened here. And I said, but why do you think it happened? He said, I don't know, this is just a weird place, <laughs> right? So. So if that's your level of explanation or justification or interpretation, that tells me that maybe there's not as, as much rigor that, uh, has, that, that could have been brought to the situation uh, as was brought to the situation. So one, oftentimes that restoration is by best guess. And, and uh, you know, a lot of times we have to. We, we just don't have any other choice. But, but you need not leave it at that, right? The way we combat that is to have active assessment, rigorous assessment. And key with this problem is not just restoration by best guess, not, that's not the, the, the complete problem, that's, that's a potential problem, but it's made a problem by having no monitoring or monitoring that is done being done too simplistically to, to help us, to, to tell us what's going on. And to show you what I'm talking about, here's, here's uh, an example. So let's talk about first wetlands. We'll talk a little bit, we'll talk more about wetlands uh, shortly, but, but um, just for purposes of you guys getting into it, I'll just say that California has the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportion of wetland loss of anywhere in the US. So that's not quantity, that's proportion. And so this is essentially the amount of wetland when California became a state to now, actually, these numbers are about are about ten years old or so, but but still, it it it, it makes the point. So we only about nine percent of the quantity, the absolute aerial extent of wetlands that were here back in the day still exist. Now those nine percent that remain are not like necessarily kick butt and just awesome wetlands, but but just for the sake of our let's talk about the quantity. The 
almost everything is gone. It drives me nuts and I have to bite my tongue because I have to like dialogue with people all the time. Like, Why do you want to save another one of these things? You not say, I'm not gonna, I don't want to save another one of these things. Almost everything is gone, dude. I'd like to have a book on my bookshelf. I'm not talking about having a library. We've long passed that point. So, so we have the unfortunate distinction of having the greatest proportional loss. Ohio has, has lost 90% of their wetlands, so they're really close to us. Um, Louisiana has lost the greatest amount, absolute uh, aerial extent um, in terms of quantity. But, but um, then we have places like the San Francisco Bay Area, which has suffered disproportionately uh, compared to other areas. So this image, which I like, which is from an old earthquake map from several years ago, but I like it in that it shows essentially what happened in one little picture. So almost all the gray stuff fringing the bay, most of that was wetland. And we essentially filled that in. Um, not modern era, but with um, er, silts from people mining in the Sierras because they're going to get gold. Um, so we, we have this, you know, hugely problematic issue where, again, it's not just the quantity of wetlands, it's the amount uh, and, and distribution of the wetlands as well. And so in this case, this is a site I used to work on that's all heavily fragmented. And just to make the point, what you're seeing right here, this is a false infrared image. Um, and and the, uh, what looks to be red here in this image, which is grassland, this whole area used to be grassland, right? So you can see that it all used to be contiguous. Now it's this little pocket um, in this particular case. All kinds of stuff is always coming up about re wetland restoration. You guys might have just seen the, the um, stuff from Orange County yesterday. Um, but what is the case, um, and, and this, is, this is a long way to get to my, my uh, no, no naive monitoring, but, but um, we are getting better with stuff. We are improving. So one way to do that is um, look at, this, this is, this is a, a, now a classic technique. So a new graduate student doesn't know what to say. They always start their talks with one of these slides. But, but in this context, it, it helps out. So I'm showing you till 2000, and then we're going to do an exercise in a second to look at this a little more in depth. But basically, this is the amount of publications in, in peer-reviewed journals that mention in the title or in the abstract or in the key word the term restoration success. On the, up, on the uppermost graph. Again, the axis is over time. So starting in 1981 in this image up to the early 2000s. And the, the beige color is people that's used it in any kind of article anytime. And then the, the smaller subset is people that mention that in the context of a wetland. And what you see is over time, people didn't talk about restoration success. And increasingly, it's the subject of more and more investigation, more and more rigor, et cetera. Similarly, we were talking about adaptive management a minute ago, same kind of idea, right? Back in the day, nobody talked about it increasingly more. So that tells us, is that tells us that uh, even if, that, that, that people are paying attention to this more, right? We might not have solved the problem, but it's becoming more of an area of focus. So people are doing more academic studies. And so we're able to learn more, we're able to grow more, we're able to take more things away. So right now, Put this on pause. I want you guys to fire up your computer and go to Ngram. Okay, so I want you guys to um, do a little exercise here for five minutes or so. This is Ngram Viewer. Has anybody not used Ngram before? Okay, a bunch of people. Okay, all right, everybody. everybody. <laughs> all right, so this is not, so I just showed you academic journals. Okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something similar. Um, uh, this is part of Google's effort to turn the world into tur turn the world's books into digital books. So Google has been scanning for many years all these books, old books, new books. Well, new books are easy, right? New books you can you can get a PDF or electronic version of them quickly. But they've actually been scanning in books as well using optical character recognition to turn that that black and white image into letters, etc. And so a few years ago, this appeared. And what this is essentially, this is the ability to search all of the world's literature, um, at least all the world's literature has been scanned in at one time. So in this case, 
which you can do, you can type in anything you want, right? So here, type in ecology, let's type in biology, let's say, right? And we get something that looks like this. What we get is, uh, and, and you, can set the da you can set the date range. You can only go back so far. You can't go back super far because they're still scanning and stuff or stuff isn't in, or, or, or books are not written in English or stuff like that. But, but basically, you can pick this time frame. And then, uh, what it's, and so this goes from back in the day to now, right? And then this is this weird scale. This is of all of the words in the massive gazillion, trillion, I don't even know what the heck it is, gazillion, million um, uh, words in the data set, what proportion of those words are, are this, right? And so right now I just typed in biology. So it's going to uh, not be case sensitive. So it's going to be biology with a capital B, maybe that started a sentence, biology with a lowercase b, um, you know, whatever. So, it, it, so you, you can adjust all that. But the point is, what this is saying is, hey, let's have a look. Before about 1840, people didn't really use the term biology. And they started using it. And then it seemed to really start to get popular. It started to get really popular. It seemed to peak around 1930. And then, and then not so much. People weren't using it very much in the lead up to World War uh, II and such. But then after World War II, it started to come back into vogue. And now it's become more and more and more and more and more, and more popular, right? So we can do biology, comma, physics. And now it'll overlay. So I just did a word or, or, or a couple words, and then comma, and then another group of words. And that'll overlay these two things. So physics is a more popular term than the term biology, right? So this is a fun thing. This is a great thing for Thanksgiving uh, parties with your relatives. Like, what's more important, uh, you know, men or women or something, right? <laughs> and, and then you get into the whole thing of, so does that mean that physics is more popular than biology? Quite possibly. Or maybe it means that a different word was used back in the day, right? Maybe natural science or something like that. Um, so the point is, so this is a fun thing to play around. So what I want, what I want you to play around with right now is... The term restoration success, ecological restoration, restoration ecology, adaptive management. Play around with some of these terms, and then I want to hear what you guys find in a second. Okay, so, so play around for a minute. So now, now one of the problems with this type of exercise is, is, again, people might use the word for something else, right? So we might think of conservation in the environmental context. They might think of conservation in terms of curating books, let's say, or, or something, something of that matter. So clearly there was a big spike. People, people liked that term back then. Again, this is a relative term. So this is of the books of that year, the, the proportion of time that that phrase. So that, that one maybe says, maybe there's not a lot of books being produced back in, in 1712. Maybe we haven't scanned in a bunch of books. And maybe, maybe we're more likely to grab the books that the librarian had. And so maybe, maybe his or her books are more likely to talk about conservation. So, so there's, there's sampling bias here, but still. But in general, there was something that went on here. Maybe this is real. Maybe this is art an artifact. But over time, it seems pretty clear that it's been fairly low. And then it re wasn't until the 1900s that it really started to take off. And we can see a couple different blips with, um, you know, um, let's say the environment, modern environmental movement, um, that kind of stuff that um, it really takes off. So that's conservation was the other one. Uh, again, very new term. Um, so this would be a great one. We're as we've talked about, farmers have been doing this forever. So this concept is not new. The terminology is new. All right, then you said some other ones you guys want to do is restoration success. Um, a, a, a big blurb here, and then again dies back sort of similar to conservation, and then kind of on this long arc to, to more and more and more stuff. Um, restoration. Restor people are paying more attention to restoration and restoration success over time, right, as we've, as we've just seen. Let's talk about what some of the typical measurements that we might do uh, for a given project. So biotic measurements, the measurements of the living components of the ecosystem are pretty common. 
And again, these are these are examples I've just lifted from real uh, permits that that uh, just you know not naming them. I don't want to shame anybody, or whatever. But a typical one would be something like in the case of a wetland restoration, coastal wetland restoration here in California, something like, okay, you're going to do all this, you're going to make all this, and then we will no you will have considered uh, to have made another wetland if, and then it lists a bunch of things. So one of the ifs would be if you have 80% cover of salt marsh vegetation after five years. Okay, so that's looking down, usually with the quad wrap, but looking down from the, from the air down and, and, and measuring all the aerial extent of all the plants and then breaking those into native critters or, or salt marsh critters versus other, excuse me, not critters, salt marsh plants versus other plants. That's one example, common thing, percent cover. Biomass is another one. Another example would be more species specific. So this one says, uh, okay, so you've restored it if uh, you have native salt marsh species evident by the end of five years. So that just means that not necessarily we have to have a thousand of them, but they just have to have those species present, say, in your site. So there's nothing wrong with those two goals, right? The only issue might be if those are the only goals or those are the only rulers by which we're measuring success. So if, if that's solely our measurement, what I'm going to suggest, so you might look at that and go, that sounds great, right? Like, well, like what, what, what seems wrong with that to you guys? Yeah, I, I just, I just, yeah, I just screwed that up. Sorry. I should have asked you before I, <laughs> I said it. Yeah, okay. All right. That good teaching, Sean. Uh, so, um, so anyway. So anyway, so, so those things are too simplistic in and of themselves. They're not bad, but if, that's, if they are, are our sole tool, that could lead us down some bad pathways. So for example, they're too simplistic and they can allow something that's poor to be judged as adequate. And let me show you what I mean by that. This is what I mean by that. This is some data from a friend of mine who now runs the Army Corps of Engineers wetland uh, Wetland Lab back east. A guy named Mark Sidall. This is from his uh, dissertation uh, research from. Uh, so okay, so so Mark uh, was working for the Army Corps of Engineers, and he wanted. To, and so the Army Corps of Engineers, as you guys uh, have read or will be reading, um, are a key player in the management of wetlands in the United States of America for essentially historical reasons. So they're the entity that that give you the permit that say you can go ahead and mess up a wetland. Right, to put your shopping mall in, your road expansion, whatever. And, but then they say, okay, yeah, you can do that, but you have to make more wetland. Check, okay. So what he did is he went in, now he had not done any of these projects, so he just went in the office, so none of these were his projects, so he didn't necessarily have a dog in the fight here, right? So he wasn't trying to, he, he didn't have to worry about being overly sensitive or looking stupid or whatever. So he went, and he, in this case, he was specifically looking at uh, riverine wetlands, so wetlands, you know, the sides of rivers, basically, creeks and rivers, in Orange County. And uh, he wanted to know, so he went and pulled all these permits, said, okay, hey, here's, here's a project we allowed to impact the, this river, and they had to do X. And then pull another one, pull another so he pulled all these. And what I'm showing you is the proportion of all those projects that he pulled that fell into a given category. The first category on the left is planned mitigation. Now, mitigation, to be clear, mitigation is when we have an impact and then we lessen the bad side of the impact. So mitigation means to fix the wound, basically, right? So restoration can be one of the tools that you use to mitigate uh, for an impact, right? So here's all the plans. And he pulled, uh, there, I can't remember the exact number. I probably should look it up before I came in here, but it's, it's dozens and dozens of plans, right? Dozens and dozens of projects here. I should also say to start with, they varied. Some were relatively small, some were relatively big. Some were relatively young, some were on the order of 20 years old, right? So, so it's a range of stuff we're talking about. The first column, let's look at the first column on the left. First column is how many of these projects had a plan to, to do the restoration? And the answer is 100% of them, almost by definition, right? So they're, they're so, okay, so that's great. So the first step, are we, gonna, are, we gonna, are we getting a successful restoration? Boom, everybody's got a plan. A legal plan that, that the, the impactor or the owner or whoever signed 
and this regulatory agency signs, the legal contract. So they both signed it. Okay, that's the first column. Next column is uh, the permit conditions. So this simply says, hey, at year one or at year five, you will do X, right? And again, he was doing this study in the 90s. The stuff was happening in the 80s and 70s and whatever. So this is not like modern sophistication, everybody you know, trying to scrutinize everything. This is just simple stuff. Of those permits that, sa that said that everybody legally agrees to do whatever, it, to the extent of m restoring a wetland, planting some plants, just the minimum stuff, check it out. Now we get into colors. Green is successful, meaning yes. Red meaning means absolute failure and purple is yeah maybe you know definitely not a full success but not necessarily a full failure either right so it depends if you want to be conservative or you want to be liberal in terms of your definition but there we go so we find just to start off with check it out 17 percent of those projects weren't even done okay so still not a rigorous <laughs> Not a rigorous metric of success, but nevertheless a little more rigorous than just simply having a permit, which is the first count column. Okay, so now we're going to increase our sophistication as we go to the right. So the next column is qualitative evaluation. So literally, he got in his pickup truck and drove around Orange County, and parked on the side of the river, and and put in park safely parked, walked out and looked. Did not go in and take soil measurements, did not go in and count the baby chicks and things, just simply looked. Very qualitative. This thing was supposed to be, you know, like a creek. Did it look sort of kind of like a creek or not? Notice what's happening. The restoration success is going down. The number of projects that would, could be clearly, would clearly be considered a success drops to one-fifth of the total projects, right? And then if you use anything that's more sophisticated, anything that's more rigorous, in this case, this is something we'll talk about later called an HGM or hydrogeomorphic evaluation. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a thing where you go and you look at the soil and you look at how water flows. It's, it's a more sophisticated thing. What you find with that is virtually everything fails the test of is this a healthy, well-functioning creek slash stream slash whatever. And this pattern we see repeated over and over again. So the take home message is when we use a simplistic metric that allows, so check it out. Did everybody have a plan? A plan? Yep. 100% had a plan. But if we really look at it with a realistic thing, almost everything fails with HGM. So by having those simplistic measures, it allows bad stuff to be considered good stuff. And everybody pats themselves on the back and they go forward. So that's not a good thing, right? Now, this is Orange County in California. This is Florida. And, and I, we could show examples ad nauseum, but the point is same kind of idea. Hey, what proportion of your projects were a success? Which persons were failure? And what we find is almost everything fails the complete success test. And it depends on where we're talking about, depends on how long we're talking about. All these various things influence performance of the restoration. But the point is, just because we did something, that does not mean it's going to necessarily uh, become an ideal thing and work well. I would argue we need more functional assessments. And so a lot of the readings we'll read over the course of the semester will, will be examples of this. So this is another, this is probably the second most important graph I would say you guys should know from this, uh, this class. All this really is, is a modified version of that first graph. So let me walk you through it again. So it's age or time on the bottom. In this case, it's age because we're talking about the performance of the restoration. So it's age since we started the restoration or, or since we completed the initial construction or whatever it is. And then again, that, there's our, our old fa favorite guy on the left, our function, right? Measure of function. You pick whatever you want it to be. Height of the plants, uh, uh, reproductive rate of the birds, whatever. So to have a useful assessment, a useful metric to know if our restorations are performing uh, like we'd like them to, we need, I would argue, two important things. The first is we need a metric that's able to distinguish the pink line at the bottom from the green line at the top. 
Now, what am I showing there? I'm showing over time, things vary. Some years it's a good rain year. Some years it's some years there's a bunch of predators around. All these various things. So it's it's rarely the case that our critters or our function will be purely constant. It's always going to go a little bit up, a little bit of down, and we expect that, right? This is physics. So, you know, this isn't physics. It's much much harder, right? Physics is easy. In comparison, we have a very complex dynamic system that's constantly fluctuating. So it's that much harder to figure out what's going on. So we have means, measures of error, variance, all that stuff. So we acknowledge that by, with the, for example, the top green line showing it's going up and down. Okay? We want a measure of the system such that we can easily statistically distinguish the green line from the red line. And we can say, with, with no equivocation, yes, the green line is better, the, green, the site that's green is better than the site that's red. And if it's the green, let's measure that in an area we know that's healthy. And so we're going to call that a reference site or a reference condition. That's our target. Cool. The red is the area maybe that we did not restore or an area that we restored that sucked, right, that didn't work. So over time, it might have started on the upward tick, but over time, it's, it's remained uh, significantly lower than our reference site or our target site. Cool? That's the first thing. So a metric should be able to distinguish those two. Secondly, to be really useful in our modern world, we would like to be able to distinguish the orange line. What's the orange line? The orange line is a system that's getting better, but it's not, it's not best yet. So uh, if we just look, so let's look at this part, right? Let's look at this point in time right here, okay? Boom. So if we measured this point in time, we'd have our reference condition, our reference level of functioning. We have our failed level of uh, functioning, or maybe, maybe that's our starting level, either one. But then our, 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 our orange site here is, um, is not distinguishable from the field restoration. So if all we did was just measure every so often and look at the level, we might say, ah, total failure, that sucks, right? Rather, if we want to do adaptive management or we understand these systems are complex and take a while to restore, we might say, that's okay, but let's come back in a year or so and let's measure it again. And let's see, okay, so again, here's our reference condition. Here, here's, so we were at some level up here, okay, cool. Here's our, here's our failure or the site we didn't restore. Okay, that's bad. But hey, check it out. This dude is blipped up a little bit. So that's good. So now we can use that to measure the slope of this line or the so-called recovery trajectory of this line. So two parts. A metric that can distinguish good from bad, functioning from failure, but then two, one that's sensitive enough so that we can tell, are we on the right course of action? Why is that important? Yeah, I'll ask you guys, why is that important? Why is it important to, to be able to know this, this recovery trajectory? If, why is it important to know if the, if the recovery is this shape versus this shape? Can you guys think of any reasons? And that way we know that if we're doing something, like if we're adding more plants, like, okay, this place likes to have more of these types of plants, so we should probably either stop adding them and see if they can, can sustain it. Or okay, not. we're good. Hayden. I have to remember to have you guys say your, your name the first time so that everybody else can learn everybody's name. But, but good, okay, but good. So, okay, good, that's, that's a possibility. What else? I've crushed everyone. Nobody's participating. Well, Jayla. Wait, who are you? Jayla. Jayla. Oh, yeah. Um, are you saying like the shape of the line? Like why is it important or just like sure. the two lines? So why is it, what I'm saying is why is it important to to not only be able to distinguish green from red, but to be able to distinguish the, say, orange from the red. That's the intermediate stage. That's and why is that important, though? It's important because we need to take the intermediate stage to get to the green stage. Like, you can't just be like, oh, this sucks. Well, let's just do this one thing, and it's perfect. We have to take the, we have to see, like, what goes wrong, what goes right. Because it has dips in it. Right. It goes up or down. Okay. So we have to take it to measure. Okay, good. So, for a couple reasons, right? So, one, to know that we're, it's working. It may not have worked fully, but we're on the right track. 
So if it's on the right track, we might say, oh, dang it, it's going to take us another 20 years. But we have some confidence that we're, in 20 years, we're going to be where we want to go, right? So, so we, we, we started the ball rolling down the hill, and it's not the bottom of the hill yet, but at least it's moving down the hill, right? As opposed to the red, it ain't moving anywhere, right? It's stuck. We need to do something different. That's really key in our world, in the world probably most of you guys would go work in, um, in addition to just that, because there's still, you're more likely to get resources earlier rather than later. To be clear, let's say this restoration age takes 100 years to get there. At the end of 100 years, we would all say, ah, yeah, the, uh, the red line is a failure. Mm -hmm. But we usually can't, especially in our world today, we cannot wait 100 years and just see what the hell happens, right? So here's an example. So I have a permit to drive tractors around in my wetland and kill wetland plants in the course of building my wetland, right? So yeah, we understand you're going to kill a couple birdies and kill a couple bugs, but we understand that you're doing this in the context of making more birds and more stuff, right? So therefore, we'll give you a permit to drive your tractors around the wetland. Maybe my permit works for three years, right? So I'd like to know, after I finish construction in the first six months, I'd like to know at year one or year two if I need to get back in there and drive the tractor around and make deeper channels or whatever, right? So one, the legal permits are still in place, so we can do that. Because if they expire, I'm gonna have to find way more money, I'm gonna have to start the process over again, I'm gonna have to justify it, it just gets much more complex. So administratively, price point, whatever. And then, uh, 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 thirdly, you, a lot of times we wait too long, everybody just goes away, right? The firm moves on to something else. The friends of group now starts working on marine debris and they don't care about this anymore, right? So, so everybody's eye is focused on the thing right now. So the, the, the quicker we can do the, manip the adaption, the better. And, and then also, it works better. When we know, if we know stuff's going to hell in a handbasket, let's fix it right now, as opposed to waiting 10 years and let that function continue to degrade. So for all those reasons, if we can, so, so a, a helpful metric monitoring is needs to be able to distinguish green from red, but ideally be able to follow the recovery trajectory or also called the restoration trajectory. Cool. Let me show you an example of that. Here's an example. So this is uh, from Magoo Lagoon, right out by, by school here. So this is the salt marsh estuary. Here's, here's PCH right here, right? Campuses were up, up there somewhere. So here's PCH. Here's the Naval Air Weapon Station. This is, well, not Naval Air Weapon Station. I'm old. Uh, now it's called Naval Base Ventura County, is what we're supposed to call it. But this is, the, this is Magoo Lagoon. And so this is all salt marsh, okay? And this is uh, some work that we did a long time ago. And so this is... Uh, one of our tidal creeks. This is a salt marsh. We've yet to talk about wetlands yet, but this is a, a type of wetland. Um, intertidal, dominated by salt water. Those little white things you see on the side of the channel are Cerithidia californica, a, a horn snail, a little mud snail. This is, and so I'm holding one in my hand right here and uh, uh, measuring it so you can see how big they are. They're, they're about the size of your pinky or smaller, half the size of your pinky. And they live on the surface of the mud, and they munch diatoms. They munch uh, single-celled alga individuals, and they just they graze them. They're a snail. They go around. Like... They have a pretty trippy life cycle. So um, when we look at them, many of them, especially the larger ones, are parasitized. They're parasitized by these... Um, trematodes, these worms that get inside of them, and this is super great, castrate them, right? <laughs> yes, I know, it sounds awesome. So what happens is, uh, let's, uh, this is a cycle, let's start here. So here's an here's a egret or a great blue heron or whatever it is, right? Poops out. Now this bird has that parasite in its digestive tract. So now he's pooped out this, um, this uh, propagule, this life history stage of this parasite, and it's sitting there on the surface of the mud. Now along comes Mr. Mud Snail, or Horn Snail, I should say, Horn Snail, and, and, he, uh, and he grazes it up and he, and he accidentally ingests that, that uh, propagule, goes into his gut, 
And then when it gets in, 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 internal to that snail, the chemistry of the snail starts to work on it. And the guy's like, oh my God, I'm here. So he bursts out, burrows through the wall of the digestive tract and essentially makes its way to the reproduct to the, the gonads of the snail and then takes up residence. Does not kill the snail. Mm -hmm. Then starts reproducing. And this is a really smart parasite, yeah. Uh, no, uh, no, diff diff different, different phylum, but yeah, but, but, but kind of the idea, little worm things. So these guys go in there and they essentially take up all of the biomass of the gonads, of the snail. Does not kill the snail. We can have some of these snails that might be alive for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. They're still alive. So this guy's really smart. So this guy's living in the snail. The snail's living, eating, you know, going through all the daily physiology and everything. But instead of that snail producing snail genes to go into the next snail population, it's essentially producing parasite genes. So evolutionarily, that snail is dead, even though he's still alive ecologically. He can't contribute any of, 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 of his or her genes to the next generation of snails from that area. So then the, then, then the snail is doing its due. Then, then, and, and so it's sloughing off. Now it's sloughing off these the next life history stage of the parasite, right? So that parasite sloughing these guys off, and then that guy will get into another so-called second intermediary host. Could be a killifish, it could be, there's various things. But basically then, then that thing gets eaten by the bird. The bird eats that thing and then flies around and then poops it out and then goes to the bathroom somewhere else, right? So this, so this parasite doesn't damage the intermediary host or the primary host. It only messes with the uh, reproductive output of, of this guy. So pretty cool. Now we've, oh God, I don't remember. I think we're up to 19 species of Magoo. I can't remember how many species, species of these trematode parasites we have that just infect our snail and, and, and castrate them. But there's a lot. All of those, or at least most of those are species specific. So they need, they need a specific bird species and a specific second intermediary host to complete its life cycle. So it's really cool. So in other words, in other words, if we have a diversity of these trematode parasites in our snails, that tells us we have a diverse food web. You guys with me? Because if we didn't, if we, let's say, let's say if this species needed a crab to complete its life cycle, we didn't have the crab, that means we wouldn't have that parasite or we'd have hardly any of that parasite in the system. You guys with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now here's that, here's that test. So here we go, here's species richness. So instead of function, I put in species richness. Right? A measure of biodiversity, if you will. And then here's a measure of age. Cool. Here is uh, the number of species. And this, the, the symbol represents the mean. Oh, let me step back. Let me step back. So this is what we do. So we go out and we pick up these snails and we get adult snails. So, so we don't get the little babies. The little babies pretty much have never been infected. The big honking toad old guys, pretty much all infected. So we, we pick a range where the size where they're, they're some of them parasitized, right? So we have a specific size range. I should also say, these are incredibly, just by way of ecology, these are incredibly important members of our ecosystem. So we've measured on the order of 10,000 of these per square meter, these snails. So these, these are really abundant. Now, now if we go out there right now, there, we probably won't see that many snails. In the wintertime, as we start to head in the wintertime, they all leave this tidal channel and they're up in the vegetation. So they're hiding out in the vegetation. So they're only down here in these high abundances in the summertime when we tend to not have storms. In other words, not big rain events that might flush them out to sea. So, so and in this case, this is, this is, this at high tide, this would be all water, right? So this is a tidal channel. This is a channel that's draining the wetland. So there, there's all this mud flat and it's perfect highlight area where all the diatomaceous films grow. And that's why they're there. Is that cool? Everybody okay with the ecology of that? So incredibly important. So, so by estimates, also by way, of, by way of background, some of the estimates are our friend Kevin Lafferty and his colleagues, UCSB, um, have suggested that as much as half of the individuals in any one of our West Coast salt marshes, half the snails are parasitized. Meaning that effectively, as far as keeping the snail population going, they only have half those individuals that can contribute to the to the uh, evolutionary lineage of that species.
Okay. So anyway, okay, so we did this. So we went and we went to some of our restorations that, that I did and or uh, people did right before me at Magoo Lagoon. So all the same site, all the same geography, the same rainfall, same blah, 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 blah. And uh, in this case, I'm showing you two of those, Magoo and L Avenue. This is up in, um, this is in another part of the marsh. But green means reference condition. Green means relatively healthy marsh. If we go out there and we measure the plants, we would say, ah, health, lots of plants, lots of fish, you know, marshy stuff, wetlandy stuff, looking good. The green, or excuse me, the, the uh, orange are restorations that, um, I guess both these restorations I did, so these are both my fault, I guess. Um, so, 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 so circle is Magoo, triangle is this other site at L Avenue, also Magoo. And then green is restoration, yellow is reference. Let's see what happened. We first start, so here's, we just started, did these restorations, went in, and then and we collected the mm -hmm. snails. Initially, there's, and so this is, and I, uh, I'm gonna forget the methodology, it's so long ago. I think we collected 100 snails at each, each place, okay? So of the 100, how many species of do we, trematodes did we get? We got about, on average, a little more than seven. Okay, um, per site, we, we, we had replicates and things like that, transects and stuff. So, um, so this is an average, and this is a standard error, these error bars. This is a measure of the spread, the measure of the variation. So the first little bit, all we have are, are parasites at our reference site. The restoration site is so new, we don't have any snails at all. There wasn't even anybody to, to collect. So clearly that's that we don't have that food web complexity if the critters aren't even back yet, right? So, that, so that's a clear difference. So we can tell reference from degraded state. But then check out what happens over time. Then after about six months, we repeat it and look, same thing. We, we have, um, uh, and note that the, the green is bouncing around a little bit, right? Natural variation, year-to-year -year variation, stuff like that, sampling error. Uh, still, nothing in the restoration. Then look what happens a year and a half. <gasps> I'm an awesome restoration ecologist, <laughs> right? So, so now we actually have snails, thank God, right? But then we crack them open, they are statistically significantly different from our reference site. So yes, we have snails. If you just looked at the site, you would say, ah, snails are here, check. But the functioning, in this case, the, the trophic diversity, the food web complexity, is not equivalent. We would not say that's restored, right? It's better than the degraded state. It's an improvement, but it's not restored. And then look, what's, look what happens. Then by year two and a half, check it out. There's no, the, the error bars overlap. There's no significant difference in the diversity of the parasites at, at year two and a half, at year three, at year four, et cetera and it's remained that way since. So we've achieved what you might call restoration success or functional equivalency, and it works, right? So this is, this is a, I would suggest, this is an example of a really useful restoration metric, right? Because what it says is, it says we, we went in after a year and a half, and by grabbing this thing, the other, the other reason this is great is because it's very simple. I, we can train you guys to do this relatively easily, right? This doesn't require us spending, we can go out and grab 100 snails. You can do that in, you know, 10 minutes potentially, right? Bring it back to the lab, crack them open, and, and look at their gonads and see if they have these parasites, right? Now, identifying species A from B, that takes a little bit of time, but, but to see if they're there is very easy, right? It need not take a PhD biologist six months to do this, right? It's a relatively simple metric. So these more sophisticated metrics do not necessarily need to cost a lot of money. Sometimes they do, but they don't have to. And so this is useful because now we can come in at a year and a half and go, ah, okay, check. We are not equivalent to our reference site. We're not equivalent to where we want to be, but check it out, dude. We're, we're four, I don't know what we are. We're, we're about not quite four and a half species on average which is, you know, about, about half of the reference site. So that's good. Let's not do anything, right? It's, call, it's all good. We don't need to drive any tractors around and plant more plants and spend more money. We're on the right trajectory. So that's why this a metric that's sensitive enough to not just distinguish the, the green level here from the zero, but it's also sophisticated enough to help us determine on the intermediary steps, are we going in the right way or not? Because then, if after year two, all of a sudden, if it started to drop, 
You can imagine the situation that if year two, this went to here, and year three down to here, oh my God, let's do something now in year three, as opposed to waiting 25 years to realize, oh my God, this place sucks and it's you know, nothing. Does that make sense? All right, good. Next, before we uh, finish up today, I want to talk about restoration assumptions. A key part that we will again see repeated over and over again throughout the semester as we're reading things and talking about things. And I really, really, really want to drive this home to you, right? This is something that can apply to all of our conservation and resource management things, but especially restoration. When you read about a project, or especially when we talk about the design of the project, you guys should be asking yourselves, what are they assuming? Here are a few assumptions that I see over and over again. One, we can recreate the historical conditions that used to exist here. The classic is, as I showed you guys last time, hey, here's a map of the, what the wetlands used to be 150 years ago. Let us do that. Mm, that's an assumption that we'll be able to do that legally, feasi feasibly, and then it's also an assumption that, that the conditions are similar to what they were 150 years ago. Okay, so the first assumption is that, is that it, history is even possible to reinvent or invent again or whatever. Another one is that the, it, it's possible to physically manipulate the abiotic elements of the system in a way that would allow plants and animals and stuff to come. A third is that, um, uh, especially for our wetlands, this is a really important one for our wetlands, we can take crappy soil and make it good. <laughs> the classic one for us in Southern California is sand. Everybody has sand. Well, let's put some sand down. No, wetlands are mostly silt, mostly fine grain sediments. So stuff like that. So that, so that inadequate starting material, can, we can just make it adequate. Well, just, you know, just a little more money or just a little more whatever. Thirdly, or excuse me, fourthly, that um, the critters we want here, um, uh, they'll come along, right? So if we put some starter plants in, then the butterflies will come in, then the coyotes will come in, everything will just come in. Uh, then a fifth one would be um, uh, that we have to have uh, the exact disturbance regime in the past to have this system be restored. These may be true. These assumptions may be true I just listed for you, okay? But rarely do people state them that way. Because people so rarely define their assumptions, it's easy to have imprecise goals. And it's easy to be misled when things don't go the way you want. It's okay if these assumptions are wrong, but it's always better to state them. Then there's no ambiguity. Then we all understand that you think that we can recreate historical conditions. I just want to be clear. You think that we can make the, it the way it was. And the other person might go, yeah. And I might disagree, but okay, at least we're on the same page. So then when, <laughs> so then when it doesn't happen, I can say, ha I told you, no, no. Okay. The general approach to restoration I, I, and, and I'm simplifying this, right? The people have theory about restoration all up and down the spectrum. But, but I'd say in general, for us, as a starting point, um, two common approaches to broad categories. We're going to do a restoration part. The first is we get the structure in place first, okay? We get the logs in place. We get the boulders in place. We shape the channel, whatever. And then... The, the functioning, the processes come back, you know, after we get the structure together. An alternative approach is, no, 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 you start with the process. You get the process going first, and then you worry about structure. Again, I'm painting these as extremes on a spectrum but the reality is most people are, aren't, aren't completely always 100% one way or the other. But it is true that um, I would say most people take the structural approach. 
So first we get the structure in place, and then we hope that the egg egg laying rate of the birds goes up and all that kind of other stuff. Here would be some examples of what I consider to be classic uh, stage setting for a restoration. So the first one is a, in my hand are a bunch of uh, native seeds for a grassland restoration I was doing. And uh, right, I'm not planting a bunch of plants, I'm planting some seeds. So I'm going to scatter some seeds around this landscape and hope that the processes are going to start, start in, right? So the rain's going to make them germinate, there's going to be enough um, predators to eat the grazers so the stuff won't, go, won't all get eaten, etc. So something like seeding an area might be something. On the lower right, this is a project to restore coral reefs. So you see, um, you see uh, this, this white thing is ceramic fake coral head. So we've put down this ceramic fake coral head with the idea being that now it's a place where baby little larval coral individuals can land on there. The planula can land on there and start to, one, recruit and then start to grow. So again, I didn't, I didn't plant a bunch of coral. I'm just setting the stage. I'm putting the structure in place where hopefully the processes can start to occur upon. And then on the, the left side here would be one of our uh, controlled burns. Um, and this would be a case where uh, I've essentially burned off all the invasive species or tried to burn, didn't, but whatever. I tried to burn off all the invasive species, right? So try to re, you know, erase that bad structure and start clean. So a oh, I know, it's so cute. I know, my son's 13 now, so this is an old picture. But <laughs> so this is, this is a, a, next I want to talk about one example of theory that we'll, we'll talk about later and, and go into this again in the semester. But again, just to give you an example of the type of theory we're talking about and, and, and the way we should be thinking about things and the dangers with assumptions, let's talk about this. So this is my son. This is in one of my restorations up at Stanford University. And, and we used to have to wear these safety vests. So uh, uh, I, we, we made him a, a safety vest. So he has a little baby safety vest, but it's very, very <laughs> cute, very cute. But so he's crawling around. So this is, uh, we talked about this last time, but the Field of Dreams hypothesis, right? The Kevin Costner movie. Um, so that was, if you build it, he will come. So this is my joke. I just built the restoration. Look, then a baby came, right? That, that's supposed to, supposed to be funny. So this was first articulated in a pe paper by a bunch of folks in 1997 in the journal Restoration Ecology. And... Um, the idea is essentially this, what I did behind my son. So we, this was a, a seasonal, this is a wetland and a seasonal creek restoration. So it looks, the dirt's all brown, right? That's because we just drove a bunch of tractors over, scraped it all up, changed it. So we changed the physical structure, in this case of the channel. And then we put in um, uh, these, uh, we'll talk more about this later, but put, put in these, um, um, essentially a, a diverter to make the flow go a certain way. So we build up, did a bunch of stuff. Okay, we, we did the structure. And the idea is, hey, will stuff now come to that structure? So the question that Palmer asked, Palmer at all asked is, is the restoration of the physical structure, is that enough to recover species or to recover functioning? And then what I did when I was in graduate school is I was so interested in this hypothesis, I uh, had my friends do a bunch of work to look at this with us. So we created a database. And, and we'll do something similar to this later in the semester. So we created a database so we could analyze stuff. So this is, this is not our own data. We simply went to the literature. That's why we, you guys can do this. This is a great example, a great project. Capstone, people looking for capstone projects, great project. People looking for other things, great project. Go mine the literature and ask some questions about the state of knowledge about that literature, right? So it doesn't, doesn't require you buying any permits, doesn't require you going to any island or whatever. And so, so this is what we ask. Are wetland restoration fields of dreams? So like Bob the Builder, like if we build it, can't, yes, he, I don't know how to say that. Yes, he can or something, I forget. Can we build it? Can we build it? Yes, we can. Okay, so here we go. So here's what we did. We went, we went and got a, a survey of the literature, read a bunch of papers, 
that had something to do with wet, wetland restoration after the restoration had happened. So we had some measure of what happened after the restoration. And so, so this data, this is, this is, the database has grown since then, but this is, these are some old slides, but they serve to make the point. So we had 70 papers and uh, we had uh, a whole bunch of variables that we decided to score, right? So the name of the project, what the goals were, et cetera. Um, the, the, the projects varied in age. Some were less, a few were um, uh, one to five years. All were at least a year, if not older. But, you know, about 40% were more than five years old. So they, they'd been around for a while. They wouldn't, weren't just um, started. Similarly, in terms of size, there was a range of sizes. So some were very, very small, the size of Sierra Hall here. Others were you know, the size of campus or, you know, the campus core or bigger. So range of size, range of age. We had some other things that as we go through the course of the semester, you guys will, um, will learn about, but, but one sense, so one metric is, um, uh, do we have contiguous wetlands? Meaning is our restoration touching other wetlands? Is it one, one thing in the middle of otherwise healthy habitat or is it out by itself, right? That's what that's a measure of. And then landscape connectivity is wetlands, as with many of our ecosystems, do not, in fact, all of our ecosystems, do not exist in isolation. So, for example, in our coastal wetlands here in Southern California, fresh water has to come in from the hills, right? Seawater comes in from the ocean. So uh, we might ask, are those connections to surrounding ecological communities, are those intact? And so that's what this is. Is it highly disturbed? Is it, is it totally on its own? from the other elements of the landscape? Is it, is it mixed? Okay, so you guys are getting the idea. The idea is there's a range of all these things, range of age, range of size, all that stuff. So we're not just picking one subset of wetlands. Everybody with me? Is that cool? Okay, so here's what we did. So this is a little cartoon version of the database. So we said, hey, again, at the time the paper was published, we said, according to, to various metrics, as you'll see in a second, did the project totally outright fail? Did it meet the minimum thing? So in the case of, you know, do we have species? Did any species come? Right? And so it's either going to be unacceptable or acceptable. But if the goal was to have 10 species come and only five came or something, right, that would be, yeah, it's acceptable, but it's not totally perfect. Or sometimes you even get more than you wanted, right? So that, that's what it was. So we went through every single study and, and a lot of times, the, the studies referred to maybe more than just one wetland. And so we went through and we scored all these things, right? So this is basically reading the paper, and then we had a sheet that we filled out. And people said, okay, what about this? And filled it out, right? So, so there we go. And then we throw all these answers from all those sheets into essentially an Excel file, you can think of it as. Cool? And then we summed everything up. And so... Uh, If many or all of the things that we were measuring, the performance metrics, were acceptable or exceeding standards, we would say that's a, that's a success, right? So we built it and everything came. The species came, the functioning came, right? But then we have some things like this where eh, it gets into a judgment call, right? And then it starts to get real dicey and how do we compare stuff? So if, it, if sometimes... You guys with me? So if sometimes in those projects or those sites um, we had acceptable but not every single time, is that a success or not? So we basically had two definitions. We had a, a relatively strict definition of what success was, then a more generous definition of success. Cool? All right. And this is what we found. So the question is, if we build it, did species come? This first over here, this is for all the taxa, right? So the, the um, orange bar is if we use the generous definition, the brown is if we were using the more strict definition. So let's just, for sake of argument, let's just use the more generous definition. What that says is a bit less than one third of the time when we built it to restore these critters, did the critters even come? I'll say that again less than one third of the time that we built it, did it come? 
And we can get some sense as to what's going on here by breaking this down into looking at different groups of organisms. And so I've arranged these for you guys in order of movement, ability to move. You guys with me? So plants can have seeds that blow around. Birds can fly from, say, one wetland to another. And uh, fish can sort of swim at a little more restricted. Inverts a little bit more, right? So what we see is, or what do you guys see? What's the pattern? Right, right. So they're more likely to come if they have the ability to move around the landscape, right? So for example, uh, plants came less than half, but still closer to half, you know, 40% of the time plants would come. As long as we have the structure in place, the plants came on in. That's cool. But if we're talking about invertebrates, it's more like one-fifth of the time did they come. Cool. So that's with... That's with critters. Now, what about function? What do you get, what, what's your guys' prediction? What do you think is going to happen with function? Do you think function is going to be similar to the taxa? Do better? Do worse? What do you think? Okay, so who thinks, who thinks function is going to do better than, than species in taxa? One, two. You guys got to vote. You can't do this bullshit like half, half a hand. Okay, so who thinks better? Okay, so one, two, three, four hands. Five hands. Okay, who thinks it's going to do about the same as... Uh, taxa. Hi, gotta do hi. Oh, so almost everybody. Okay, good. And then who thinks that um, functions can do better than taxa? No one. Okay, let's find out who's true, who's right. Oh, so notice my scale bar changed. So this, this goes from zero to about 50%. This goes from zero to 20%. So functioning happens less than taxa. So, so just because we built it, the function came even less than the species came. So, right? Everybody with me there? And if we, and we, we talk about what function, maintenance of biodiversity, uh, reproductive output, primary productivity, second productivity, however, whatever you want to pick, again, there's some things that seem to do better. Breeding seemed to happen, you know, uh, better than some of the other things. Probably because the breeding is the easy part, right? It's the raising the baby, keeping the baby fed and protected from predators, that, that becomes hard. But, but you guys get the idea. So by using this type of an approach, it's making our assumptions explicit. You guys with me? So just because we build it, maybe it won't come. Does that mean we're stupid? No. It means we should be more explicit to say that just because we build it, things might not come. So therefore, maybe we should inoculate our wetland. Maybe we should cut out a couple pieces of uh, wetland sod from a healthy wetland and put it in the middle of ours so those microbes and those, those little bugs and things get inoculated into the site, right? We help them in. Don't just, don't just walk away and assume that little, that little ladybug is gonna fly 200 miles and land in our, our site, right? So by being more explicit with our assumptions, we're becoming better restoration ecologists, right? And understanding the system. Why did this happen? Why did this not happen? Cool. You guys with me? All right, good. And then there's also a few other things here just to, we're wrapping this up here, but just to say um, there are other things that matter. So size does appear to matter here. That if we restore a 20 acre wetland, that seems to do better at recovering, um, say in this case, function than a small one. And the same thing happens for, for species, right? So you can imagine if you're a bird, you're going to land, if you have a 20 acre target versus a tenth of an acre target, it's probably easier for you to find the bigger one, right? So, so size does matter. And then, oh, there's some other things too, but I guess I didn't put them in there. So, okay, so, so from f the conclusions we can take away from that meta-analysis and that field of dreams hypothesis exploration, and that's what the FOD stands for, field of dreams, that if we build it, they usually don't come. Don't lie to people to make yourself look better. Let's just acknowledge that. Say, that's all good. Well, I mean, it's not all good, but it's the reality. So let's deal with that. Let's bake that into the design that we assume that when we build it, things won't come. So when we design our project, we include elements from the get-go about maybe introducing some organisms, inoculating uh, some soil, or whatever the case may be. Uh, and while many factors are important, things like size is important, other things, and again, we should make these assumptions as explicitly as we can.
And that's not a bad thing. So, um, so to summarize what we just talked about in terms of our introduction, finishing our introduction to restoration, that um, a lot of times this adaption and being able to adapt our restoration on the fly, uh, or, or not, not on the fly, that's not right, but, but, but with data, a lot of times that's only, people only say that. They don't really oftentimes adapt it, even though we would, to be more successful, we'd want our restorations to be adaptable. We oftentimes have these very naive assessment metrics that are, that, you know, on the face of them aren't bad per se, but using them in isolation and only those simplistic metrics can trick us and make us think healthy system, make us think that poorly functioning systems are actually healthy. We don't like that. So the challenges we have are naive, poor assessment. Assumptions, as we just talked about, are often very implicit and people rarely state them. And because they don't state them, we rarely test them. So then we get back to the, oh no, voles, you know, that kind of talk, which, which we don't want to be. We want to be better than that. Um, and then something we have not talked about, but that'll be, that'll be uh, next, next lecture, is um, about, about hard and fast rules as to what is in and what is out of our restoration. But that's, that's more of a lead in. This graph is key. I want you guys to be thinking about this graph conceptually when we, when we get going, right? That we're going from the some degraded level to some more well-functioning level. And we, and we acknowledge that many times we end up in an alternative state as opposed to our ideal condition. That's usually better than the existing state, but we want to continually be improving ourselves, continually be improving. And then this notion that effective measurements, effective rulers to measure what's going on, not only distinguish bad from good, but are also sensitive enough for us to distinguish the intermediary stages so that we can use that to know earlier than we otherwise would if we're on the right path to ecological recovery. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. Questions about any of that? 